Good morning, everyone. Today, my colleague Melissa and I are meeting with two professors that have worked with online courses, and that is uh, Professor Sadie Wilkes with Mass Communications and Dr. Mike Martinez with Kinesiology. They have been able to provide their students with a more engaging and authentic experience by incorporating some interesting aspects into their courses. Professor Wilkes, would you tell us a little bit about your course, maybe how this has impacted the students and who the audience is, who are your students? So I teach the Introduction to Public Relations course. Uh, my students are mass comm students. Uh, generally, it's all majors, but I do have a certain percentage, 30% uh, or so that are journalism, political communication, advertising students. So. Um, we try to cover all the basic principles of public relations, our four-step process, um, major issues in the industry, but most one of the most important aspects of the course is career opportunities and, and what does the industry as, a, as in public relations look like um, as far as job opportunities, uh, trends, things that are changing, and, and how students can plan their careers as far as what, what would they like to do. So that's a big aspect of the course. Um, and it was something that I wanted to make sure we brought over in the online course. Melissa, would you like to introduce Dr. Martinez? Dr. Martinez is here with us and he is the director of online programming for the School of Kinesiology, oversees the MS in sports management and the BS in sports administration. Uh, would you like to share about the course that we worked on? Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, the course that uh, you and I worked on was the, our, it's our, we call it our professional development course within the sport administration uh, major. And that, uh, similar to some other classes, does have a lot of focus on career, but it's, it's almost primarily focused on getting you uh, on the steps from a career perspective. It was a little different for our on-campus students is that's very heavily driven with guest speakers. Um, we, we, it's a vast field. Uh, there's a lot of things you could do within a sport administration uh, program and trying to figure out the best way to move that into the online setting. Uh, there were, uh, you know, a little unique things that we needed to approach, but it was still geared towards them furthering their career within sport management. I try to incorporate a lot of guest speakers, especially after we've gotten through the, the first half of the semester, which is focused on kind of principles and, and uh, important aspects of the, of the industry and how we practice. Um, but once after the mid semester, we start talking about the different industries and how public relations looks a little bit different based on each industry. What, you know, what are the unique challenges of, you know, healthcare versus education versus sports and entertainment. Um, and so I try to get professionals in each of those areas to come in and talk about their unique PR work and challenges in industry information that isn't necessarily in the book, right? So that's why it's so important that students really understand uh, the career options they have. Public relations is a career that looks very different from industry to industry and job to job. Um, there's many positions out there that are public relations, but they don't have public relations in the title. And so I really like to bring in professionals who have very different public relations positions and even very different titles, but the core work that they do is still focused in communication and public relations work. So I try to bring in those professionals who kind of personify those differences. Really every three to five years, there's kind of a, a different set of tools and a different way to communicate and new audiences to reach out to. So how we practice changes uh, very consistently from year to year. So uh, getting those professionals in to talk about the changes, what stays the same, what, what we need to adapt to and how to further their skills throughout their, their careers. Um, really comes best from those professionals. There's a, a lot of similarities in these courses and what you're trying to, to bring to your students. Um, talking with Rochelle, it did seem that we took two different approaches on how to translate that guest speaker to the online class. And so I want to take a minute and let you both share uh, how we both navigated that. So how do online um, guest interviews or speakers look in each of your classes? We recorded it through Zoom, and but it was a live conversation between me and my colleague. Um, and it wasn't scripted to the, like we, I knew what we were going to talk about, like what questions I was going to prompt them. 
Um, but I also allowed a fair amount of deviation from that based on how the conversation was going. So it was very conversational. It wasn't scripted. I did have some kind of direction um, and they kind of had an idea of what they were expecting, but it was, it was very much a conversation. And you posted the Zoom recording, I assume. Yeah. yeah. Um, Dr. Martinez, since I worked with you in your course, we went the podcast route um, and, and you did, a, it sounds like a similar thing. You did record with Zoom. Do you want to talk about that experience um, and, and why we kind of went with a podcast? Yeah. So um, I'm a big fan of podcasts and uh, what I have generally found is that's something that I'll do while I'm driving in the car, while I'm working out, while uh, I'm just you know, taking a walk. And I've have always wanted to try to incorporate some sort of podcast type assignment or activity with my within my online classes. It just never seemed to materialize for the topics that I was doing. Um, the way that this course is set up, though, since it's so heavily geared towards that industry perspective, it was. I thought that that was a natural way to do, you know, the podcast style. Um, and what's what's a little unique about um, our industry is most of the time what connects people within sport administration or sport management is that they do have a real passion for sports, but they may not necessarily know exactly what field they want to get into from an actual job perspective. So from my perspective, uh, it was really important to get a broad range of industry um, professionals because our students needed to be exposed to the variety of opportunities that they have. Uh, and I, podcast to me was, was just more of a natural progression because one, I listened to them a lot. Uh, two, um, I think that that was something at least for my first go round, not actually being comfortable on screen it was one of those things where I could say, okay, let's go ahead and have this conversation. Um, I did give them some structured questions, but it was mostly what I was trying to do was have them tell their story. Uh, I think I can learn a lot from people from hearing their story, their career progression. Um, and, you know, especially with an online setting, I've been in online education for um, several years now, and most of the students that we have are non traditional. Uh, or maybe they are doing a career change or, you know, they could just be working actually as industry professionals in the field, but are also trying to, you know, improve from that perspective. So it, it was just a natural thing to do it that way. Uh, I looked at it as they could listen to it while they were doing the dishes, while they were driving in the car um, uh, or listen to it multiple times if they needed to and necessarily did not necessarily have to be watching it because that's just how I normally approach taking in these types of interviews. I really enjoyed listening to those podcasts and hearing the variety, especially hearing students that had gone through online programs. Um, I just, I know the students in our program are really going to appreciate and connect with those. I thought that was great. Um, because these are asynchronous classes and you're posting these um, podcasts and recordings, how did you ensure that your students watched um, or listened to these, you know, interviews that you did? Um, Dr. Martinez, you want to pick that up and then we'll go to Professor Wilkes. Sure. Um, the, the way that I approached the students to uh, or ensuring that they did it is I built it into assignments in terms of, uh, I called them, it, it's a little, it's a little um, unique, but I called them spin pods because it was a sport industry podcast. Um, so SPIN pod. Uh, and what I did is I had them listen to two of them, but also do a reflection assignment every other module after listening to two, to two of, the, of the perspectives. And the students were given uh, uh, they were directed in terms of what, you know, kind of questions they needed to ask, uh, how it engaged, you know, within their own uh, perspective, maybe something that they didn't learn. So from that perspective, having them do those question prompts, having them do those personal reflections, that was the way that I sort of ensured that they listened to it. Very similar approach. Um, for each of the videos, I included a 
three reflection questions. First question was, tell me like the top three things that you learned from this, like things that you didn't know or most interesting or whatever. And the second was describe this person's career in one or two sentences. And then the last one is or just describe this person in, in their career, your thoughts of this interview in one word. Um, so it, it kind of makes them think about the different aspects of the interview and you know kind of pick the highlights. So it, it's a reflection exercise. And I tied that to all of the videos so that they had time to kind of reflect on it and think about it and share kind of what they thought were the most important points. Um, and actually those questions actually helped me out a lot because I think there are three things that I pulled from that person's interview that I thought were the most important. And then whenever I go back and read the student responses and see what they thought was most important or what they thought was most interesting um, can be very different. And so it does kind of help me um, in either future interviews and or when I'm putting my lectures together or, or working on class content that I can kind of go, I do go back to those and kind of see what they pulled out of those interviews. Um, and, and that does help me direct new interviews and, and new content. I really loved how both of you had such organic, authentic experiences with your speakers. Um, and I know that Dr. or Professor Wilkes, you addressed this a little bit earlier about how did you select which professionals to interview and which to include for your class? Could you explain a little bit more about that? And then we'll go to Professor Martinez on the same topic. Yeah, so like I said, I'm lucky to know a bunch of different professionals in a slew of different industries. Uh, but what I did was a combination of, I knew like, I knew which industries I had coming up in the course. Um, so politics, communications and politics was one of them, government and politics. And so I had a, a, a dear colleague of mine who spent years in DC and then worked, uh, is back here in Louisiana um, and you know has a great career in government and politics. So I sat down with her, we went through it. Um, and so then I also had an area where I was more focused on kind of the media industry. And so I interviewed someone who had more media buying experience and I didn't I looked for opportunities. So I reached out to a couple of my colleagues and said, hey, this is exactly what I'm looking for. Do you know anybody who fits this description? Um, and so I also took kind of those recommendations. And so those were like friend of a friend kind of recommendations um, when I was looking for something very specific that I knew would be you know, helpful for the students. So like if I knew somebody who fit that description perfectly, then I reached out to them personally and, and scheduled the interview. Um, and then if I, if I thought there was a specific thing I was looking for that I needed a professional in that niche. Um, then I reached out to some colleagues of mine who helped me find that person. So um, ultimately I was able to you know, fill those holes in my, con in my class content with the perfect professional. I have always done things from a service perspective and I'm a big believer, at least within you know, the courses that I teach of the practical application or the main takeaways that someone can take. Uh, I used to be the uh, president and uh, conference coordinator for the Applied Sport Management Association. So I'd gotten to meet some people through that. And uh, I've always been trying to help people get to where they want to be. Uh, most of the time, our students have an idea. And it could be that I just need the elevated degree so I can get a salary raise. But others are, are naturally trying to figure out something new um, from their career, career perspective. And prior to the last year, I've been primarily in the graduate sector. So they've already had those connections and sort of having to, you know, build those. So what I had to do from this perspective, though, is I did actually go back to people that I knew, whether it was 20 years ago, 15 years ago, one, uh, one of my guest speakers was actually my high school football coach, who is now uh, the senior associate athletic director at Southeastern uh, Louisiana University. Uh, it's just reaching out to people from that perspective. Um, and I, I really tried to think about what, where my students were and what might resonate with them. Uh, for me, if I can connect with someone and understand, okay, that story is very similar to my own story, it makes me a little bit more interested in that. So uh, I had a, a former colleague who she's the general manager of a ticket sales organization for University of Southern Mississippi, but I, I talked to her a little bit about that, but I also talked to her from a standpoint of being a working mom, 
um, because I have students who are in that area. Um, I have uh, another uh, former uh, colleague who I actually was one of his first uh, mentors, and he has has now surpassed me tremendously, but is uh, the director of uh, PR for the Dallas Cowboys. And just having those those connections and kind of reaching out to them, um, because the non-traditional student, at least in my opinion, they they are non-traditional for that reason. They have different experiences. Um, some uh, students might be working in the military. Some students may be, you know, working in a high school setting. Uh, so I, I tried to not only pick out people who were in the industries that they wanted, but also maybe pick out the storylines of some people. When you got feedback from those students through those reflections that you both did, um, can you share a little bit about what their major takeaways were and how they responded to the interviews? Dr. Martinez? Sure. Um, So from the takeaways that the students got in terms of the reflections, uh, one of the things that I did notice is you had some students that were dialed in all the way through, but others you could sort of tell that they were dialed in a little bit more when the story was very similar to what they wanted to do, either from their own personal perspective, or maybe they really want to work in professional sports. So naturally they're leaning towards, you know, that interview there. Um, But what, what I did find was, uh, and, and, and it pleased me because some of the reasons that I selected certain people, one, I knew that they would tell me yes, so that was helpful. But the other one is I really <laughs> wanted to tell their story. And their story, like my, um, I had mentioned my high school football coach before, he actually took an internship when he was 37 and for no money and made a major career change. And to see someone succeed in that route, I wanted to show that our students that it's possible because some of them are in that same boat, especially if you're an older non-traditional student going for an undergraduate degree. It could be that you have a ton of life experiences, but you may not have been the same person you were when you were 18, 19, 20, looking at what you wanted to do. Um, I uh, had mentioned uh, um, a former colleague who, uh, you know, she has two kids and brings her kids to work and is, is very um, focused on, okay, when 4.30 comes around or 5.30 comes around, it's family time. And one of my students uh, is in the same position working in a high school, um, but also has a family and she really resonated with that. Um, so it, I think what it was, it was the individual students resonated with some sort of story, some sort of aspect of the guest speaker that really meshed well with what they were doing or what they were interested in. Uh, and that, that was, the, you know, that was pleasing for me to see. Oh, absolutely. I, I agree that when it's learning that's connected to what you're interested in, they're absolutely going to engage with that more. Um, Professor Wilkes? The kind of the interesting thing that came out of a couple of the conversations uh, and very timely was two of my interviews were of people who went through the recession uh, the, in like late 90s, early 2000s, um, people who struggled, they were graduating seniors or had just recently graduated and they had to kind of reassess their career options and maybe change and adjust and uh, adapt. And so there was a lot of good advice to students and they were like, I know it's not the same, but COVID is presenting some of the same challenges. And so just know that you're not the first group of people to face these challenges. And here's some things that got me through it. And here's some ways you can kind of adjust your career um, and to not be married to a career path. Um, so, so many, whether it's a non-traditional student or even my you know, undergrad students who are more traditional as far as time-wise, um, they, sh- they feel like they should have this career path that's very, you know, like I'm gonna do this and then this is gonna happen and then this is gonna happen. And that, especially in a career like communications where it changed like how we work and you know what tools we have and our audiences are changing all the time. Like we have to be very flexible and adaptable. And, um, and so I interviewed more than one person whose career started off in journalism, which is a very common for people to end up in public relations. Like after they worked in media for several years, they transition into a public relations position. And so to have to illustrate that to the students that 
you don't have to have a career path that you can deviate from that, that you can change your mind, that your current life circumstances might, you know, change what you value and what you, and what you want to do with your time every day. So um, I think it gives a lot of students that um, ability to breathe, you know, to think about like, if the things haven't done the way I really thought they would go, that that's still okay. And then I can kind of, you know, adjust and, and move in either in a different direction or, you know, or change my focus. And it's, it's not a bad thing. It's just kind of how we work. Um, and so I think being able to illustrate that both with the, like I said, the COVID challenges kind of being very similar to the recession challenges, people got an understanding that, hey, like we can adapt and there's ways to, to deal with those kind of big challenges in an effective way. And then also understanding that career paths don't have to be defined from the time you graduate to the time that you retire, that you can adapt and adjust as it suits your interest and needs um, and, and as you go through different life change uh, stages, right? Um, so I thought that was interesting to see them reflect that in the answers that like they were appreciative that it wasn't all people who were super successful from the get-go, right? The, these are people who faced real life challenges, adapted and, and still you know, had great careers. From listening to each other, do either of you have anything that you would like to comment or express that you would have done differently or that you would like to do differently going forward with your interviews? I, I think giving them more variety and maybe letting them even pick and choose what they choose to write on. Um, because what I tried to do initially is uh, just kind of see how this goes. Um, and But what will be very important, especially for courses like this, is that content, while some of it is, is able to continue, I had a lot of COVID stuff come up within our conversations, uh, just because that's the nature of the, the timing of, of things. So maybe in a few years, uh, you know, that won't be as relevant anymore to the story. So uh, I think that would be an approach that I would take. And, and maybe I might be more comfortable getting on video, but just right now, I think podcasting seemed to work. Professor Wilkes, was there anything that from today's discussion or reflecting on your class that you might do differently or incorporate in the future revisions of your course? So I, I, very similar uh, to what Dr. Martino said, I'd like to add some, some interviews. That's something I'm trying to build up to. And I, again, I had at least two of the conversations that did have enough COVID information that I think they, will, they won't be evergreen. I'll have to go in and um, either re-interview that person or, you know, add some interviews that don't have like COVID as one of the major topics of conversation. So from your experiences, are there any tips or suggestions you would give to other faculty who might be approaching an LSU online course and, and maybe watching this and thinking about how they can incorporate guests um, into their course? Um, any, any learning experience on, from prep, uh, scheduling, um, any of that timeline? Um, Professor Wilkes, do you wanna pick that up? Uh, well, I did know which of my colleagues would be more amenable to video, um, you know, talk to them. And the other thing I did was meet with them usually about 30 minutes before we wanted to start recording. Um, I, I scheduled some time to just chit chat with them so that we had established a rapport and a conversational tone so that by the time we started the interview, it wasn't as stiff and, you know, kind of like everybody kind of starting to settle in. So like we had kind of settled into our conversation and like, oh, okay, let me turn the recorder on and so we can chit chat. Um, so that helped, I think, set the conversational tone where we kind of got caught up and discussed a little bit. Um, and, and then went into the interview. So that was helpful. Uh, like I said, knowing which colleagues will be amenable to your format um, and not be, you know, rushed or, um, you know, kind of put off by, you know, like being nervous on camera or something like that. So trying to find somebody who's a good fit, both logistically and also content-wise. Dr. Martinez? 
I think it's for something to, if someone was going to incorporate podcast or, or interview type styles within their courses, there definitely is a lot of planning involved. Um, I uh, was not always the best from staying on track with time perspective. So I had to uh, basically hedge my bets with have, you know, I, I think I reached out to 10 people hoping that I would get, you know, five or six. Um, so planning it from that perspective is important. Um, tapping into your own network uh, would also be important, especially just from a standpoint of that's a lot more comfortable, uh, you know, for the, the guest speaker. And I think one thing that I would recommend, and I've, this is something that I found out throughout my um, process of doing, you know, these podcasts, but also even from listening to other people do podcasts or even just, you know, my own experiences of guest speaking. Um, if you ask people to tell us about your job, it's a lot of times it's very difficult for them to pinpoint what it is that they should say. But if you ask people that you want to hear about their story and you kind of guide it along that perspective, most of those things still sort of come out. Um, and, and I would also be with, I think it sort of fit in with Professor Wilkes as well, is don't feel like you have to stick to these five questions or don't feel like you have to stick to these things. Um, even if it's, okay, you only wanted 20 minutes, but it's a good conversation for your students and it goes to 30 minutes, go ahead and do that. Uh, you know, pay attention to it going in. And uh, if you ask people about, something that is maybe unique of what their role or demonstrate, I think your, your aspect of XYZ is valuable to my students for this reason. I found that that was helpful. So I would look at it from that perspective. I think it sort of fits well in most of the fields that we have that are more application and practice based. I'm not sure, you know, in some lab type styles, uh, you know, environments, if this might work, but I think a lot of people, the way you advance in your career or the way you figure out the steps you want to do down the road is learning by people who went there before you. Um, and not everybody's path is linear. Uh, I was a sports journalist starting out. Um, and then I did that. And then, but I had kids and I, I really valued that. So I didn't want to travel so much and went into XYZ. And then I said, I need to go back to school and, and all these things. So uh, everybody's path is not the same. So there's going to be some sort of value uh, within people's stories. So I would just be open to those ideas. I think those are great advice and tips for faculty. Um, thank you both for sharing that. Uh, we are coming to the end of this conversation. I know Rochelle and I both really thoroughly enjoyed working with both of you to develop your courses. Um, thank you again for joining us today. Um, we really appreciate you taking your time to speak with us about your experiences. And we really hope that those that are watching um, really got something out of this. So thank you. Thank you. You're both fabulous, by the way. 